I'm happy to be here this evening with everybody. Thank you so much for registering and signing on. Um, we're pleased to welcome back Steve Wilson, who kicked this series off six months ago. And I remember um, not only did he do a fabulous job and set the bar very high for the rest of our presenters, um, he was outside and he was outside <laughs> on his lovely deck and it was just <laughs> lovely and warm outside. And um, I'm just thinking back about that tonight and knowing that we'll get back out there sometime soon. Um, Steve, again, is a co-owner of City Wine Market out at 6th and Wakarusa. Some of you probably went there to buy your wine for this evening. And without further ado, Steve, I'm going to um, turn it over to you. And I, I just want to point out that I'm sitting in, uh, in Spain tonight from the Muga Winery. And this is a picture of yeah. it. And um, so I hope you feel right at home, Steve, because this was one Absolutely. of your favorite regions. Is that right? That is correct. Um, I, uh, Sp Spain for me is, is everything that I love about wine. Um, it is, uh, it's got great history. It's got, as you can see, spectacular beauty. Um, the food, uh, next, next level food. Um, the Michelin restaurants are, are almost ubiquitous in Spain. Um, and the wine, they've been making wine for millennia. Um, the wines that we're going to taste tonight are all from uh, Rioja, and Rioja is, it, it's, it's north central. Um, if you were in where these wines are made in, in a, there's a town called Haro. Uh, if you were in Haro, within about two hours, you could be in France. Um, so Spain extends further underneath France, uh, Spain extends further underneath France, but we're right near the Bay of Biscay where it curves over into France. So um, Rioja is, as you can see in the picture, um, very mountainous. Um, the Sierra Cantabria Mountains, I, I believe that's Rioja Alavesa, um, but Sierra Cantabria's jagged, rocky mountains that um, kind of slope down toward a, a meandering river. Uh, with several, um, but the soil complexity is really high. Uh, I mean, you've, you've got a decomposing mountain range kind of dumping rock into the vineyards. Um, and if you can kind of see behind me, um, let's see if I'll take that over there. Uh, that's not very good, but the, the soil in, in Rioja is, is a lot of, I mean, again, decomposing mountains. So the wines that, that exist there, they struggle a lot, um, which yields very high quality. Um, it's a cool story. I mean, the Basque, the, so this is Basque country and the Basque um, are really, I mean, it's a semi-autonomous region. Um, they are, uh, they have their own language, which is, it just blows my mind. It's, it's a language that has no relation to Romance languages. Um, so it's its own language. And they will, if you're in this region, they will speak Basque. Um, they'll also speak Spanish and other regional dialects. But um, the Basque have been in this area and fended off invaders since they showed up. Um, they, I mean, much of Europe was conquered many times over and the Basque region never was. Um, so it, it's, it's a place with, a, again, a lot of great history um, and, and an amazing culture. Um, now the wines that are made today uh, were really kind of influenced by actually events in France. So the Basque um, had always made wine and usually, usually using um, grapes that are indigenous, not so much to Spain in general, but to the Iberian Peninsula. Portugal will often use the same grapes, although they have completely different names for them. But um, the, the, so wine has been made here for, for again, uh, I, I think the earliest records were 800 AD. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a while, it's been a fat minute. Um, but the style of modern wine in, in this part of France, in this part of Spain was influenced by France. So around 1850-ish, there was a large uh, 
vineyard outbreak of a, of a, of a, of a pest that still exists today, uh, a vineyard pest called phylloxera. And it's a tiny root-borne louse uh, that will feed on the roots of the grapevines and eventually it, it kills them. And so Bordeaux, uh, which probably maybe four hours by car, uh, now it would have been longer because they would have, I think they would have had to gone over the Pyrenees, but today they're tunnels. So four, about four hours by car gets you to Bordeaux. Um, Bordeaux was heavy, 1851 too, was heavily affected by phylloxera. Um, vineyards were completely wiped out. And so the, the winemakers in Bordeaux, they needed a job and they went south and they crossed the Pyrenees and they showed up in Rioja and they discovered that there was a winemaking tradition and they had great soils and climate for, for growing grapes. And the, the Bordelais thought, you know, but, but there are a few little, little details we could probably show them. Um, and they taught them things about um, viticulture about, you know, it, maybe, maybe pick when it's not so hot during the day and maybe crop thin, you know, do you don't, you don't want your vines producing as much fruit as they possibly can. But probably the most, the most significant influence was the Bordelais said, you know what, you need to age your wine in oak barrels. And so they really turned on Rioja to the idea of aging in oak barrels. Now, I honestly don't know why but in large part, the oak that they favor is not French, it's American. Um, and so they, but, but there, there's, still, there's still a lot of, a lot of producers who will use either a combination of French and American or, or uh, French exclusively, but they, the oak barrel is great for aging wine. It, it allows just the right amount of oxygen in and it, it, it imparts some flavor, it imparts structure. And so, the Bordelais really defined the, the region of Rioja. Their, their style of winemaking is, is still practiced um, today. So let me see, we do, actually, I'm not gonna do the screen share yet. We'll start with Muga. Okay, um, uh, Steve, I wanna yes. just interject your, your, um, before you go on to the first wine. I failed to, to say if you have any questions or comments, um, either about what Steve has just um, talked about or comments about the wine, tasting notes, whatever, just put it in the chat and I will moderate the chat for you and make sure your questions and comments are heard. And then hopefully at the end of the presentation, we can open up all the mics and unmute everybody. But we didn't, nobody said that. So I just wanted the new people, especially to know that's kind of how we do things. So just Put Absolutely. it in the chat bubble, it's down at the bottom of your screen. It looks like a little speech bubble and type it in there and I'll get the question asked for you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I, I like to meander all, all over the place so we can, any topic wine related, happy to, happy to address. Um, so for the most part, I mean, there are a lot of grapes that are grown in this region. Um, I would say more of them are, are red varietals, um, but there are some spectacular whites made. And, and they don't, white Rioja, uh, we don't see in abundance. We see a lot more red Rioja in, in the United States, but white Rioja is absolutely gorgeous. So the first wine that we're gonna taste is this uh, 2019 uh, Muga. And Muga is, is, we would consider Muga to be a benchmark producer. I mean, they've been around since, I think, 1920, 1932. Um, they, they really, um, the, the quality of Muga is, is consistent every year. So um, you, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a wine that you can buy sight unseen. If it says Muga on the bottle and it's, and it's been properly stored, it's probably going to be outstanding. Um, so this is, this is a white Rioja. Um, the primary grape of white Rioja is a grape called Viura. Um, it is also, depending on where in Spain you're growing it, it's also called Macabeo. But Viura is the, is the base wine for, uh, the base for grape for this, this wine. Um, it's also got um, a little bit of Malvasia and Malvasia, um, again, grown uh, throughout Spain and Portugal, actually is also grown in Italy, um, in, the, in the southern parts of Italy. 
but a uh, little Malvasia and then a little uh, Grenache Blanca, which is white Grenache. Um, so again, most of the, most of the grape that, that drives this wide is Viora. Um, and Viora imparts kind of a nice, sort of an herbal note, um, nice bright acidity, little, maybe some little floral notes. Um, the Malvasia, and I, I, I actually, even though I think they're, yeah, 20% Malvasia on this wine, um, Malvasia has a real nice kind of, uh, it smells like a peach pit. I mean, it's not super peachy, but it smells, it has that peach aroma. And there's a little bit of that peach pit kind of banging around there. And then white Grenache is, is I would say in this case is used for acid because Malvasia and Viura sometimes in, in the warmer months, uh, I mean, if the, if the harvest is particularly warm, um, may lose some of its nice bright acidity, but it that, that Grenache Blanc kind of keeps it fresh. But this is a wine that um, they would have, uh, this, this particular part of Spain is, is, is actually, um, so if you go further south, you would have tapas. Um, but because it's Basque country, they don't eat tapas. They eat what's called pinchos and it's spelled P-I-N-T-X-O-S. And so a pincho is just like a tapas. It's a tiny little, little something or other that you would have um, usually with, with wine or beer or bubbles. Um, but um, pinchos are, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, an amazing, ama I mean, it's, it's worth visiting for any number of reasons, but there's an amazing little seaside village. Oh, maybe from where we are here, an hour and a half um, called San Sebastian. And it sits right on the, on the Bay of Biscay. And it is, there are, in, in, the, in the town of San Sebastian, um, there are more Michelin restaurants per capita than any place on the planet with the exception of Kyoto, Japan. Um, and the great thing about these are, there, I mean, well, there are white tablecloth restaurants. The vast majority of these are actually bars. And so you would go in and you would have a chef who is, not just at the top of the game, but at the top of the top of the game, um, serving you a little plate for maybe $5. Um, and so you go into these pinchos bars and you get a glass of wine like this and they have all sorts of things, foods, some hot, some cold, and you order pinchos and you, you eat. And, and actually it's very traditional, you throw your napkin on the floor because the, the, the Pinchos bars that have the most napkins on the floor are obviously considered the best. Um, but you, you, you eat and you have yourself a little glass of, uh, of white Rioja um, or, or red Rioja, depending on what your Pincho is. And then you move on to the next bar and you, you, you pretty much do that all day. It's, it's a, it's, you eat in small portions and drink in small portions, but you do it, do it constantly. Um, so uh, yeah, Muga, uh, a great producer um, that I actually have a, one of their most famous bottles is a, is a bottle called Prado Inea. Um, this is a Grand Reserva, it's actually a Magnum, but um, Muga makes uh, red, white, um, and kind of everything from everyday wines to wines that you would sell her for generations. Um, spectacular producer, high, highly, highly recommend it. And we can, we can, we can take questions on, on the white if you'd like. Um, or we can move move right on to the red. If anybody has a question um, or a comment yes. about the white, you just ra raise your hand. I can see you if your camera's on, and we will just. Okay. Yes, Shelley yeah. is asking to repeat the name of the foodie town. Oh, oh. Uh, San Sebastian. San Sebastian is the name of the, the Michelin foodie town. Yeah, that is, uh, the beach is spectacular. I may have, we'll, we'll look at some photos. I may have some photos of San Sebastian. These are unfortunately um, trip photos. So I apologize for the quality, but I, I think we, there may be some photos of San Sebastian. Okay, and um, Cap, Captain? Yes, I was wondering, I've heard of the Alba Reno grape. Mm -hmm for Spain, and is this a Rioja region area or grape? Actually, or yes. Separate? No, it is. Um, Albarino is, where you typically find Albarino is, is in, an, in a region that's um, right above Portugal. 
Um, there's a region there called Rias Baixas, and it's a fairly cool climate region, but um, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it um, lots, I mean, that, that would also be a wine that would show up in the Pinchos bars. Yeah, love Albarino. And the, the throwing the napkin on the floor is a sign of, um, you know, it, it's a it's a chef's kiss. It's a yeah. damn damn yeah. that was good gesture. It's, it's sort of <laughs> awkward um, because it seems disrespectful. Um, uh, you you kind of want to clean up after yourself, but um, no, the the restaurants there that is that is the tradition. Um, and 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 typically. You'll, the, the parts of San Sebastian, and again, Pinchos bars are, there, there are other, other towns that are, are famous for their Pinchos bars within the Rioja region, but San Sebastian is easily the most famous. Um, they're kind of narrow medieval streets with um, bars and every bar will do something different. They, everybody has their specialty, uh, but uh, yeah, it, it really is, it's a, it's a foodie paradise. You, you get up in the morning, um, late, of course, um, and you, you go to the, the old town of San, uh, the old parts of San Sebastian, the historic district, and you maybe eat until about one o'clock and then you go to the beach because uh, it has a spectacular uh, beach and you, you have some, some sun and then you go take a siesta and then maybe around seven o'clock you get up and you get ready and you go back out to the Pinchos bars and you do that again until, I don't know, maybe midnight. And then you then you rinse and repeat. And are um, these yeah. are these chefs necessarily impressed by the Michelin designation? I mean, well, we're, they're se they're selling five dollar plates. Are they? Yeah. Well, this is this is kind of where if you if you if you aspire to be a Michelin chef, um, this is where you would go for training for training. I mean, this is you're going to um, work harder than you ever have um, with standards that are ridiculously high. And you have to appeal to large crowds of people. So um, the, yeah, the, the quality, I mean, there's certainly many, many white tablecloth restaurants in San Sebastian and throughout, throughout Basque country. Um, and, but yeah, they actually, I wouldn't say they're as obsessed with Michelin stars as, as the French are, but um, no, I mean, it's, if, if you have a Michelin star, I, I actually was at a restaurant um, about a week before they announced that they were getting their second star. And I think they knew because the chefs were rather giddy. Um, but no, it's, it's, that is a huge, 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 um, you know, sense of, I mean, uh, mark of pride. They, they, and plus they will get people from all over the world to fly in just to eat their, their $5 food. But no, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, oh, here's a comment from, Lisa, uh, she says, I find the aroma icky. Maybe it's that peach pit uh, quality, but this wine tastes marvelous. Why is there such a difference between the aroma and the taste? Um, well, I guess, I mean, it, it, it is. It's funny, I, to me, it, it, I, I smell like um, on the nose, I smell um, uh, quince, like kind of that apple pear combo. I do smell the peach bit. Um, and then there's some herbal notes. And, and actually Viora has, I mean, you can basil, tarragon, um, herbal notes like that. Um, and then, then, there, then there's actually the minerality. I get, I get, I mean, this, this has, there's sort of a note of wet concrete and we would describe that as, as minerality. Um, as you can see, um, the, the, the soil that this grows in is, is <laughs> laden with, with minerals. Um, so it typically follows that you would find a little bit of that in there. Um, it's funny, uh, to me, wine, wine are, are, every wine is, is like a, um, I don't know, a, a painting or an author where you smell it and you're like, yeah, I know that guy. Um, this to me, it, 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 it just smells, it just smells like white Rioja to me. I mean, like if, if I were tasting a blind, I'd be like, ah, it's probably white Rioja. That, that is the profile. Um, but flavor, flavor and aroma, um, occasionally correlate, but not always. Um, the, the chemistry of a wine so when a, when, a, when a wine evaporates, 
Um, uh, let's see, esters, ethers, aldehydes, and ketones get released from the wine and collect in the bowl. And those are different than the ones that remain kind of in the glass. So, I mean, it, in part, that's the joy of wine. Um, it, it sh I would say, I mean, we, we generally taste all the wines before we put them on the shelf, um, if we're gonna sell the wines. And quite honestly, one of the most common critiques that we'll have of a wine is, it's fine, it's just boring. Um, and kind of one note wines, um, it, it's, it's easier to make a one note wine than, than, a, than a kind of a, a multi-note. But um, no, I, I, I um, what, how, would you, how would you describe the icky? Okay, Lisa, type type out how you would describe the icky. Maybe it's that in, in just just her terms. However, she what whatever she thinks icky. Okay, you can you can um, you can expand on that. In the meantime, Rosie and Larry say, uh, Steve, your knowledge is amazing and impressive. How do you know all this stuff about wine, food in Spain? Um, well, a number of things. Um, my my business partner and I have sold fine wine for about 20, 20 some years. Um, we, we did, we did actually go to school and study wine academically, um, at the uh, Culinary Institute of America in, uh, California. Um, but we drink a lot of wine. Uh, as I said, we don't, we don't sell any wine. Uh, we, we don't rely on advertising to, to sell wine. So it doesn't really matter to us what somebody else would say about a wine. We would, we would taste it and decide ourselves. So it really, it's, it's, you know, practice makes perfect. Um, we, we taste a lot of wine, but uh, I, I will say I, I, we, we do travel a lot and um, going to Spain and, and tasting wine there uh, helps, helps kind of, kind of, you know, provide the, provide the background on it. Okay, Lisa has responded. She's, she says it probably, uh, it would say wet concrete and yeah. maybe, a, maybe a tinge herbal. So you nailed yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, wine, there, I guess, if you're thinking about wine, there's, there's kind of like two general categories. There is things that smell like fruit and things that don't smell like fruit. And I mean, wine should always, you know, wine should always be fruity. It is made from fruit. It should taste like fruit. That, that is, it doesn't have to be overtly fruity and it, it shouldn't be kind of fake fruity. There's, you know, fruity like, um, you know, Kool-Aid fruity, shouldn't be Kool-Aid fruity, but natural fruit. I mean, wine has the ability to mimic thousands upon thousands of flavors. I mean, and what it's doing essentially is chemically creating the same profile that the natural scent has. Um, so when you smell, you know, peach pit in there, it's, it's not because they've added peach pit. It's simply because that's what the chemistry of the smell of peach pit is, and it happens to be in the wine. And some of those things are, are created through the grape. Some of them are created through fermentation. Uh, some of them are created through aging, but um, wine is, a, is I mean, it, it really is an incredibly complex chemical stew. And humans, I mean, what's amazing about that is humans figured out that that was kind of cool, like 10,000 years ago. And for the most part, and, and actually interestingly, so the grape that makes this, so Viura primarily and Malv Malvasia and, and uh, Grenache Blanca, they are all actually part of the same general family. Um, it's, a, it's a family of grapes called Vitus vinifera. And vinifera vines are, I mean, 99% of, of grapes that most people are familiar with come from the vinifera family. Um, so humans even figured out that while there are many, 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 many families of grapes, there's one tiny little offshoot that does the best work. And, it, and it's because it has the most chemical complexity um, of all grapes. It ages, it changes. Um, I mean, I would imagine that the ancients really were most concerned about keeping things from spoiling. Um, and this doesn't, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't ha it has, it has minimal amounts of added sulfur, but, and actually the Romans figured out that sulfur was a, a great preservative. So it even, there's even history with, with adding preservatives, but, uh, no, it, it's, it's, I mean, the, the, the fact that, that wine can 
be so different. Um, and, you know, when you're smelling wine, I mean, there, there, there are certain things that a grape, I mean, an orange is going to smell like an orange. And we all kind of know what that smells like. But what it doesn't take into account is, I mean, I, I grew up in Arizona and I had orange trees in my, in my backyard. And there are smells that I'll get from some oranges, not so much from others, that remind me of my childhood. And so there's that. There's all of the things that you have in your own personal inventory of smells that kind of jump out. And, um, you know, it's, I always think of, you know, our, 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 our memory and our sense of taste, they kind of live in our brain in a duplex. And you can kind of hear what's going on in both sides of the duplex. And so a smell will come across and you don't know why, but suddenly you remember, you're, you flash back to a time, you know, I mean, who knows how, how far back. It, it's a memory trapped somewhere, but that smell and, and wine has that complexity that can, can draw that out. Yeah, you know, that kind of relates to Ed and Chris Everett's um, question. In your opinion, what would be the best way for someone to develop their ability to differentiate mm -hmm. between the various wine smells and taste notes? Practice? Um, there, I mean, there, there are actually a couple things that, there are a couple things you can do. There's, there's um, and, I, and it, it's still in production, but years ago, there uh, was a, a friend, I think it was a, I think he was in the wine business, but he partnered with um, some people in the French perfume business and they created a, uh, a portfolio. I think there are about 50 different isolated smells. Um, and it's, it's a kit, it's not, it's not cheap, it's about 500 bucks, but it's a kit called Le Nez de Vin and it's, it's the nose of wine and it, it has isolated smells of the most common aromas found in wine. So there's, there's that, but basically, I mean, the way in, in wine school, the way, the way often it's, it's taught is um, they will take a wine and it's, it, it's defined as a neutral wine. So it, it, it's a, usually it's a, like a inexpensive Italian Pinot Grigio that really doesn't have much. I mean, it, it's, it's got wine smell, it's got Venice smell. And then you might drop a piece of orange peel in that wine and then you smell it. And then maybe you drop a piece of tangerine in that wine and you smell that. And it, I mean, we've, we will, we will taste, I mean, in, in, in learning to isolate smells, we'll actually isolate single smells in a, in a glass of wine in lab, lab prepared samples and smell that until we know that smell and you can pick it out because it, it is sort of a challenge. Initially, um, wine, you kind of have to push, I guess maybe the way to describe it is if you were a, if you were a scholar of music and you were sitting and listening to a symphony and you could pick out all the individual instruments um, because you know what those instruments do and sound like and you kind of know where to look for them. And, and the fact that there's a whole other symphony playing, you can still isolate in your mind those, those things. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just practice. I love that analogy. Uh, well, I want you to be able to get, uh, some of the questions coming in are a little bit general. Uh, so we might save those until the end so you can get to the red. Mm -hmm. But I, I do have another question from Cap wanting to know what uh, what foods you would pair with this, this, the white with the, um, yeah. so this part of Spain is, is very, very, I mean, close to the, the ocean. Um, and there's a lot of seafood that would go with this. Um, I mean, really they, they, I mean, everything. And I, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day about, about the, F, the, the ethics of eating octopus. I, I love octopus. It's a really smart creature, so I feel guilty, um, but it's delicious. Um, so uh, they, they, they do a lot of octopus, um, all sorts of, I mean, a lot of seafood, shellfish, um, cheeses. Uh, they do a lot of, of uh, sheep's milk cheeses in this area. Um, I mean, it's very, because the, the fruit is, is present, um, actually, Asian cuisine would do very well with this as well. Um, so sushi, um, Chinese, I mean, just 
take out Chinese food would be great. Um, the, the versatility of, of this region, I mean, the versatility of the wines kind of reflects, I mean, they, you know, when you go to San Sebastian, you, you find things that are modern and find things that are traditional and, and it, their wines work with both. Um, I mean, Spain is, I, I, there's, a, there's a concept called gastronomic alchemy where you essentially take, you know, it might be um, taking a solid and turning it into uh, a liquid or a gas. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy, crazy stuff. You know, I, I've, you'll go and um, I, I was actually, I was in San Sebastian and, and served a, a plate of what looked like a plate of olives. And when you eat the, what looks like an olive, it's actually just a gel and it, it, it evaporates in your mouth. Um, and a wine like this, perfect for that. So Spain, Spain is very, I mean, it's, it's old, it's new. Um, what goes with their food? Yes. Um, I mean, it, it's, it, it, but but the fruit profile Asian cuisine really likes high acid and and nice fruit profiles and I think I think actually if there were one food probably something something like Asian cuisine would be really delicious. Okay, thanks. Okay, it's part two. All right. <laughs> so let me. I'm gonna jump in here. Uh, just a second. So if you're going to share your screen, everybody, you will want to be on speaker view for this so that you can see his pictures full screen. So um, if you're not already there, you'll want to switch over. Let's see, sorry about that. All right. Am I still with everybody? Yep. All right, good deal. We're here. Okay. So this is, uh, again, one of my most favorite um, wineries. Uh, it's a winery called La Rioja Alta. Are you, are you thinking that you're sharing your screen? Am I? You're not. I'm not. Not yet. So hit hit share again down at the bottom in the blue, the blue button. Oh no, sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe I'm. So after you hit the green um, share screen arrow, then you you should see choices like your desktop or your yeah. whatever files you have open. And then you have to then you click on that and you have to hit share again. Just a second. Okay. There we go. We good? Uh, we are good. Yep. We're All there. right. Let me. There we go. Yep. All right. Yeah. All good now? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Yes. So La Rio Alta, um, one of my favorite producers, um, has uh, it started actually as a cooperative and, and I can't remember what it stands for, but that's that SA part there. But they are located in Haro and Haro is a little medieval town uh, in, in La Rioja Alta um, where Muga is, actually Muga is down the street. Um, let's see, sorry. I don't know why I'm having issues here. Maybe because you're in full screen, I'm thinking. Maybe, yeah. Did you hit your escape hit escape button? Yeah, it's it's got a I got a thinking wheel here. Oh, I hate the thinking wheel. Yeah, it's it's 
Okay. Well. Hmm. Yeah, it's not wanting to escape. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop. Am I okay. back now? You're back. Okay. I'll try one more time. <clears throat> it happens. <laughs> Zoom happens. Ooh. Whoop. We'll get it here. Just make sure your tax return isn't somewhere on there. <laughs> <laughs> well, for whatever reason, my photos don't want to pop up. So we'll, uh, that's okay. Okay. All right. There we go. All right. Apologize, but um, basically, um, La Rioja Alta is what would be considered kind of a, a classic style of Rioja. Um, they, uh, and, and they're meticulous about many, many things. And, and one of the things that I would say is true of the Basque, insanely hard workers, like that work ethic in Basque country is, is standard. You, you, I don't know whether, what happens to, to, if, if you're not a hard worker and you're Basque, I don't know where you go. Cause I don't know anybody who's like that, but, but it is, it is ridiculously, the work ethic is, is really high. So um, true to form, um, the uh, La Real Alta, um, again, they learned to age wine uh, from, the, from the way the Bordeaux, the Bordelais do, um, but they weren't happy uh, bringing in barrels. So to this day, um, La Rioja Alta has pallets of American white oak shipped to them. And they have a cooperage on their property where they have people whose job it is just to build barrels. Um, so they build barrels to their, 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 their own specific standards. So that's kind of the first like, you can, you, can, you can just call up and order them. And they're like, yeah, I know, but we, we don't do that. Um, so that's the first uh, part of kind of the labor intensive uh, process of this. Then, and, and they still do this, they will, they, they, they will age the wine because this particular wine is a reserva and Rioja is, is, a, is a protected um, region. So in order to be a producer in Rioja, you have to meet very, very high standards. And if you want to uh, label your wine, say a reserva, you can't just decide them I in the United States. Uh, reserva doesn't mean anything. A reserve wine in the United States uh, is, is it, 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 it can be, we just decided that it was reserve. There, there is no standard. Um, in Rioja, however, um, reserva means that it, it spent at least, and it can be more, but it spent at least two years in barrel and at least two years aging at the winery in bottle before its release. So this is a 2015 uh, Reserva that actually just got released. I mean, it, 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 we got it, I think, oh, maybe October of 2020. Um, so that's the first thing. So La Rio Alta kind of takes it a step further. Not only do they, they cooper their own barrels, they also will um, they, they do not uh, like to filter their wine. They do it through uh, gravity. And so the, the barrels are, are stacked in, the, in, in, a, in an aging room and they will actually open the tap on the bottom of one barrel and w using only candlelight, they will, they will rack the barrel into a new barrel. Um, and so the, the sediment, the, the solids kind of stay in the first barrel. They actually do this four times. So twice a year for two years, they will rack this barrel by candlelight. Um, they'll, 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 they usually change up the barrels, like the first barrel might be new, um, the second barrel might be a second, you know, used once, emptied and reused, a uh, second fill barrel, but they, they will mix the barrels, um, new and old, but everything gets racked by candlelight and then it's bottled and then it's put in the cellar for an additional two years where it ages. And 
this wine, I mean, as I said, this is a very classic style of Rioja. It's 100% Tempranillo. Uh, Tempranillo is the grape. Um, they grow Tempranillo elsewhere in the world, a uh, little bit in Portugal. Um, they, they grow it in, in several other places in Spain. They don't always call it um, Tempranillo. They, they uh, in the Toro region uh, of Spain, they'll call it Tinta de Toro. But um, this is actually 100% Tempranillo. So some, some Riojas will have other grapes, but this is, uh, this is 100%. Um, we would characterize La Rioja Alta as kind of a classic producer. So you smell on it, and we'll go back to the smell, sort of a, a little bit of like a, a, a balsamic vinegar note, um, but a, a, an aged, oxidized um, wine barrel kind of note. Very deliberate, that is part of it. Um, the, the, the alcohol um, is usually 13 and a half, 14 and a half. It's, it's never high. They don't want... Um, They don't want um, high alcohol wines from Rioja because typically when a wine gets gets you know 15 to 16 percent alcohol, it becomes less food friendly and and they're they're big eaters so they, they want it to pair well. Um, but uh, so this this is um, it has that kind of cherry balsamic note. Um, it does again. It spends time in New Oak, so you get a little bit of the cedar wood, um, some some barrel tones in that. Um, but nice bright acidity, um, kind of a mouth coating uh, fruitiness. Again, hugely food friendly. Um, and the great thing about this wine, I, I mean, I have lost bottles of this in my own cellar and gone back many years later and only to discover that this $20 bottle, you know, is even better 10 years later. Um, it, it, it's probably very, very, these days, not a lot of wine is really designed to age. I mean, three to five years is fine, but more than that, it really isn't engineered to be that way. Um, Rioja is not that way. Rioja is great out of the glass, I mean, out of the bottle when it's released, but it, it just keeps getting better. Um, I've, had, I've had Riojas from the 60s that still showed tons of fruit and ironically probably sold at the time for about four bucks. Um, it, it is... Again, I absolutely love this region. Um, the, the food wines are great. So for, for food on this, um, this part, they, they eat a lot of lamb. And I apologize to people who love sheep, but their lamb is delicious. They, they eat a ton of lamb. Um, and uh, so, so lamb and pork uh, are probably the two proteins that they eat the most of in this area. And, and both of them do wonderfully well with this one. Well, first of all, may we please, please, please do the next Zoom from your wine cellar, mm. uh, please. And secondly, uh, Lisa and Marie, Maureen both want to know, what does rack the barrel mean and why, oh, okay. in, why in candlelight? Well, okay, so when you, when you rack a wine, um, what you're doing, I mean, when a wine, so uh, let's back up, in, in, the, in the production of, of in, in winemaking, so the grapes are brought in from the vineyard, um, and in, and these are these are harvested by hand. Um, they then go to what's called the crush pad, and the crush pad is kind of the the receiving area for the grapes. And they'll have people there who will take the, the grapes out and start sorting them. They'll they'll remove um, you know any leaves or stems or sticks or anything that's not related to grapes, and they'll start sorting. Um, once they're sorted, they go in and, and sometimes they will, they will remove the stems of the grape, other times not. It kind of depends on the wine. Um, but once they decide that they're ready to press, they'll crush it. And they don't want to, they don't want to, to absolutely demol, I mean, it, it wouldn't be like running the grapes through a blender. They kind of, in fact, um, technology is allowed that you can, you can inflate a, a bladder inside a tank and slowly pressurize that bladder so that you can you can press the grapes to the point where maybe they just split open. Other times you might want to smash them flat, but you, what you don't want to do is, is crush the seeds that are in the middle. They're usually two seeds in the middle and they've got a lot of bitterness to them. So you don't want to crush those. So once they're crushed, it's fermented. And then once, it's, once that fermentation is done and it usually takes, oh, 
weeks to months uh, for that, it'll go into a barrel. Now, when it goes into the barrel, there's a lot of sediment from that initial crushing. And we don't want the sediment in there. The sediment, and oftentimes it's, it's rather bitter. And so the idea is to remove that sediment. There are a number of ways of doing that. You can do, you can, you can pump it through um, uh, kind of a, it's sort of a, uh, like a coffee filter type medium. Um, you can pump it through bentonite clay, um, which just removes the solids. It doesn't impart any flavor or anything. Um, but the most old school, old world way of doing it is let gravity do it. So um, if you imagine, let's say that the barrel is sitting oh, uh, maybe five feet above the ground. And you start by drawing liquid off the top of that barrel. And as the barrel uh, gets to the bottom, gravity has probably settled out all of the, the sludge at the bottom. Well, we don't want that. So they are, what they will do is actually, they will wait until they start seeing, they'll, they'll hold the candle behind the stream of wine and they will wait until they start to see uh, sediment show up in the stream. And the candle illuminates, it, it actually does do a pretty good job illuminating that stream. But when they see that the solids kind of coming through, they shut off the barrel and they'll, they'll usually top it off with another barrel so that, so that the, the, there's not a lot of air inside the barrel. They don't want, it's called head space, but they want the barrels topped off, but they also want them uh, free of any sediment. So they will allow gravity to settle out solids and then, and it's called racking. So they will, they will remove the, say the top uh, four fifths um, is actually probably more like 15, 16. I mean, they, they remove most of the barrel, but what's left is a tiny amount of sludge and that gets discarded. Usually it, it goes out to the vineyard as fertilizer. So were um, you able to witness this happening when you were there, Steve? Uh, they were actually, um, I have seen it. They were racking one barrel and I honestly don't know whether they were just doing it for us. Um, it, it, but yeah, they, they will, they, every, every barrel will have a little chalk date scribbled on it that this mm -hmm. is when the next racking occurs, but they will do for this wine, they'll do it four times, uh, before it goes into bottle. And wow. the way they, I mean, as you can see there, there is no sediment. There are no, there, there are no floaties. Um, and they do, but it, it's, I, I guess I always, you know, I, I, I associate it with the fact that that's Basque. Like Basque would, would, they would do that because it's the best, hardest way to do it. And of course they would do that, you know? Yeah. Okay, we've got some questions and I wanna make sure I get everybody in. Um, so when you're talking about aging a wine after release, are you speaking of just the reds or the white Riojas as well? Um, well, actually, in just a second, So I have, I, there's a, a cooler next to me. But this wine, so this wine is actually from right down the way. It's also from Haro. It's from a, a producer called Lopez de Heredia. Um, this, and, and I don't know if you can see, but this is a 2009 White Rioja. They just released it. So Lopez de Heredia decided, and it, it kind of has that straw color. It's, it's clearly an old white, um, but this is just beginning its, its, its life. Um, Spain is, is, is interesting. They, they don't believe that, I mean, they, they, their wines do age very well, but they don't believe that it's the consumer's job to age it. So they release wines when, I mean, if, if I opened that 2009 White Rioja today, it would be good. It'd be very good. And the winery has decided that it's ready to go. Um, but if I open it in 10 years from now, it's still gonna be really good. It'll be different. Um, it'll, it'll be a little nuttier and more oxidized. Um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a different flavor, um, but it's, 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 it's awesome. Um, very few, like I said, very few wines really, I mean, it used to be that largely due to the way the wines were made. Um, 
the 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 wine making technology wasn't good enough to um, guarantee that when that wine, after a couple years in a barrel or in a tank, and it goes to market, it's ready to go. There weren't a lot of guarantees then. Um, I mean, as I said, you know, when 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 grapes are harvested and they come into the crush pad, and there it used to be that humans. And, and for the most part, it's still done this way, but humans will sort the, the grapes. Um, they now have, have optical scanners that will um, actually look at the, each grape and determine whether the color of that grape in this supercomputer matches what it should be. And if they find a grape, a single grape that is not perfectly ripe, a little puff of air will shoot that off to a bin and that goes out for the birds. Wow. Um, so we the the technology that that is is employed today i mean the other thing is wine um when when it ferments it creates a lot of heat and that 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 made for a lot of bad wine well now we can you know put um cooling lines glycol lines in those tanks and keep those tanks during fermentation um perfectly stabilized so there's a what what used to be required of a wine i mean it used to be that if you bought say a wine from Bordeaux in the 80s. If you had that wine in the first 10 years, it probably wouldn't be that good. It'd be really tannic, be very bitter. And then maybe year 12, 15, it really started hitting its stride. Through technology, we don't have to wait that long anymore. Um, and so the vast majority of wines um, show up on a shelf ready to go. They're, they don't need any aging. Um, additional aging, it may benefit it, but um, I mean, as, as a wine ages, generally it goes from tasting like fruit to not tasting like fruit. Uh, I mean, some of the great, I mean, as this, as, as for example, as this, as this Rioja would age, um, the cherry fruit flavors would kind of dissipate and you'd get some more tobacco and leather and earth and mushroom and funky kind of things. And you know, not a lot of people, I mean, enough people like it, but but you would have to want to know that that's what I like and that's what I'm going after. Otherwise, aging it is just just waiting, you know, to the wine is past the point of you enjoying it. Right. So this might just be a general question. How old does a grapevine need to be before it produces grapes? Um, in a general rule, five years. Five years. Okay. Um, the first, and actually it really... Um, the vines, in fact, I think I can tell you. Uh, the, so the vines for this guy uh, were planted between 1926 and 1986. Um, I don't know the vine, the vineyard. Let me see if I can tell from my information what how old the vines were on the Tempranillo. Yeah, the the vines for the Tempranillo were about 40 years old. Um, so. Not all grapes actually benefit, not all grape vines actually benefit. I mean, if you go to Napa, for example, 20, 25 years is about as old as they want their Cabernet vines. Um, however, Zinfandel, um, on the other hand, I mean, there are areas in California where Zinfandel vines are 110, 115, 130 years old, and they don't produce a lot of fruit, but the quality of that fruit, I mean, that entire vine might dedicate its energy to producing two clusters of grapes. And so the quality of that fruit is really high. When a, when a vine is young, um, it may produce a lot of grapes, but they're not very good. Um, and so oftentimes you'll see even markings in a, in a wine store where it might say juvenile, you know, a reference to young vine. Um, those are, it's good, you know, it's, it's, it's doing its job, but it really hasn't hit its stride. It's still, we're still waiting for these to kind of develop. And yeah. um, so year five is about when you start actually making wine from the fruit. Before year five, you, you would just let the birds have it. Okay. Um, you mentioned that the grapes in this region struggle and that's why they're so good. You know, the climate is challenging. How has climate change affected, well, all of the regions, but especially this one? Oh, years. in uh, immensely. Um, they, you know, it kind of winemakers are very, very attuned to their 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 environment. Um, they keep 
at least in the old regions, they keep immensely detailed records every day, temperature, humidity, things like that. Um, I would say that the changes here, I mean, we have seen alcohol levels creep up a little bit, um, but we've been able to mitigate some of that by, for example, um, you know, we have the technology to bring in huge floodlights and we can pick at night. And so they will do that. They will, they will show up as soon as the sun sets and they will strip the vines um, before the sun rises because if the sun hits those grapes, the chemistry of those, of those grapes changes. So they'll pick, and they'll pick when it's cool. Um, they, they are planting areas that have not been planted before that are, that are you know, higher elevation. Um, Rioja is a fairly high elevation. I mean, I think um, this, this uh, La Rioja Alta, you know, maybe 2,500, 3,000 feet. I mean, it's, 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 it's definitely well above sea level. Um, but no, climate change, um, probably where we're seeing it the most is in Germany, where, um, you know, German Riesling, uh, one of, I mean, sadly, one of the most uh, misunderstood varietals. Uh, it, it is truly one of the greatest white wines ever, and also responsible for some things that are just undrinkable. Um, but the Germans have been growing grapes, you know, again, for millennia, and they, um, I, I have talked with winemakers that said, you know, um, in, in 300 years, my family hasn't planted these cool high elevation vineyards because we just didn't need to. Um, and we now do. Um, ice wine, which there's a, a style of German wine called ice wine. And, and essentially it requires that the grape be perfectly ripe, not moldy, not overripe by the time the first frost hits. And I can't honestly tell you the last time that happened. Um, I used to buy, I mean, we used to be able to get German ice wine. Um, yeah, I mean, it was always expensive because it costs a lot to, I mean, hand, you know, human beings have to go out there when it's frozen and pick frozen grapes. Um, but I mean, I've seen, I've seen half bottles of ice wine, you know, three, $400 now um, because they, they literally just don't make it anymore. Um, so climate is, change, climate change is, I, I promise you, not a myth in, in the wine world. <laughs> this is a, that's a perfect segue. I'll, I'll make this the last question. And for those of you who have outstanding questions, I'll, I'll follow up with Steve um, so he can get home and get to, you've been working on all day, right? Haven't you? Actually, Jamie's in today. Um, I, 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 will, I will finish out my shift. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so this is from the Everett's again, different part of the world, but will the Oregon Pinot, Pinot vines be adversely affected by the recent ice storms? I imagine lots of ice and cold weather in a lot of uh, places. So uh, actually, um, the answer is uh, the ice probably won't affect it that much because the vines are dormant and they are, I mean, they don't like um, ice. If it depends, if the ice encases the vine in in, I mean, if, if if the water encases the vine in ice, it actually it insulates it. It protects the the vine. Um, the problem right now for Oregon is not the ice, but it was actually the fires, uh, the smoke uh, from from last summer. Um, I I'm not anticipating seeing a lot of 2020 uh, Pinot Noir. Uh, I mean, I, I, I have a producer who has made, um, uh, th th they make a wine that is um, essentially their seconds. So when they make their 50 and 60 and $70 bottles, the grapes that don't make the cut for that go into this wine. I've never seen a rosé made under that label and it has been made this year. So what that says to me is that uh, this producer harvested their Pinot Noir grapes before they were really ripe enough to be uh, red grape, uh, red wine grapes, perfect for making rosé, but you're going to get fifteen dollars or sixteen dollars for a bottle of rosé, and you might get fifty dollars for a bottle of Pinot. So it's not in their interest to do that. But Pinot Noir is very, very susceptible to smoke. Uh, I mean, a fire fifty miles away can 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 infect the. the I mean, you you will notice it. it smells like somebody poured water on a campfire. Um, and it's not very good, uh, but I, yeah. I, I'm, I would anticipate, um, I would anticipate that that 
we won't see a lot of 2020 uh, Pinot Noir. So hopefully right now, the, again, the vines are dormant. Um, the, the cold weather shouldn't be that much of an issue for it because they're not, they're not needing it to be. I mean, they're not, they're not yeah. needing sunlight and warmth at this, at this time in their stage. Okay. Well, why don't we have everybody unmute yourselves? I wanted to read, before we leave, I wanted to read a couple of complimentary comments that came over. Um, it, I think this may, let's see, wait a minute. This is one of the best explanations about making wine I've ever heard. This is from the audience, Steve. And you are our favorite wine speaker. We will be sure to buy our wine from you. Thank you very much. So. Oh. Thank, thank you, you. And, uh, thank you, Steve Wilson. That was great program. Really good. I hope everybody um, enjoyed the wine. I know I did. Um, yeah, go to Spain. Go to Spain. Spain. Oh, is let's do. Let's, go to Spain. Let's um, all go to tour. Spain. Let's yeah, all go to Spain go. together, and Absolutely. you can lead us. Let's yep. do that. Yeah, yeah, there are no bad times in Spain. Right. They they don't have bad times You'll in Spain. have to arrange a tour. Absolutely. Yeah, literary so, wine okay. tour. <laughs> so, so I, I will say we actually, believe it or not, we actually do those tours. We're not doing any to Spain uh, at currently, but um, we do take trips uh, once a year, uh, COVID willing. Uh, we're, we're, this year, we're, we're going to be going to Portugal in July um, mm, with about 15, 20 people. Um, but we, we like to, I mean, wine is about being there. And so we, we, we actually do, uh, we do guided tours. Uh, yeah. Again, usually once a year, COVID interrupted it. Uh, we were supposed to go to, to Portugal last year. And we're going this year. Right. Well, thank you, Don. This was so great, Steve. Thank you so much. I, I yeah, I, I agree. I've learned more in the, in the last hour than I have you know, about wine, maybe my whole life. So good for you. <laughs> Have a great night, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks so much for coming and we will see you next month. We're gonna keep doing this and- um, Yay. And, 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 thank and you, Kathleen. One great day program. Thank thanks one guys. Day we'll do great. it in person. That's we'll really do it awesome. in, in the soon, same room together. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Steve, thanks. Bye.